How are we? T.O. Part 2. I've had a few interesting phone calls of my live stream yesterday. And I watched my own live stream three times. First thing I've got to do is apologise for the computer blocking out and the internet dropping out halfway through a sentence. And you hear me talk about something saying up above the antenna. I didn't know it dropped out for 10 seconds. So that's not me. That's MBN. So apologies there to that. Right, interesting points. So before this internet starts dropping out, I could try and use the map. It's too hard. Right, it's too glary. Big piece of paper. Now, if I had a texture, I could draw it. Oh, let's see if we've got a pen here somewhere. <laughs> Good luck to me. <laughs> Good luck to me. Right. I kept talking about my Wollum Bar, Brunswick Heads, the boat ramp, the homeless people, Byron Bay, Broken Head, Ballina, um, the Euphoria, and all the other stuff to do with Byron Bay and Bangalore. Now, I could sit here and draw a map all day long, right? I could sit here and I could do it off the top of my head. But you've got a computer at home, like you're watching this on something, mobile phone, computer, TV set. Majority of people have got computers. Right. The interesting thing that I found was that, hello, somebody, oh, hello, somebody out there. G'day. Say hello. <laughs> the interesting thing is um, what I found out, I just had a couple of phone calls. Yes, I've had a couple of phone calls. There's a known drug dealer who has been living under, sorry, not drug dealer, drug user who's dying of cancer and his first name starts with his last name starts with a H that's all I'm going to say so Ken if you watch this you better get back to me all right um apparently he's driving around because the police station in Mwoolan Bar is closed down and the police only come out there if you go to the intercom and push the button on the police station. And when I was there in 1980, we had a guy there called, come up there on the train and called himself Jesus of Nazareth in 1980. And I got off the train. I went home and over to Hastings Point. I said, Mum, I said, there's something wrong. She said, what, what do you mean? She said, yeah, I just got up here. I said, oh, that guy got off the train with me, Jesus of Nazareth. So I drove, I'm a little bit. Uh, not nutty, but I have, you know, you get a gut feeling. Uh, I can give you several occasions um, with people as witnesses, you know. So I said to my mum, and mum's still alive. She's 86. Uh, foster mum, not my biological mum, my foster mum. Anyway, and I went back out of Moolumba and I drove into there and there's nobody on the street. Anyway, the cops pulled me up and they said, are you Jesus of Nazareth? I said, no, but I said he was on the train with me today when I come up from Sydney. And there were two detectives, and they said, well, he's going up to the local hospital and exposed himself to the old ladies and the thing up there back in 1980. I said, that's funny. I just passed him. He's over there in the park on the other side of the train tracks, over there near the railway station. There's a railway station between the old Pacific Highway, and there's a park behind the old information office before you come over the bridge, which is a bridge I've shown in my photos and previous YouTubes. And here's Jesus of Nazareth walking around a tree. It's a nutcase. He apparently escaped from right of me, psychiatric centre or somewhere, Glade School, when we had psychiatric centres. That's just one example of the nutcases I've met in my life. Um, another one was for seven years, I walked into Star City Casino on my birthday and I could easy get several people 
who will stand up and say, yes, he did it. I walked in there and I walked up the roulette table, roulette wheel, and one guy's name was David S. He's now down in Victoria. And we went in there on my birthday and I said, we walked in Star City Casino, went and had lunch, you know, I was living in my bus and I was down at Banks Meadow, down in Botany, before Dad died, just before Dad died. Right, so if you watch the other one, you know Dad died, right? So just before Dad died, I was back in Sydney. And I went to Star City Casino and I walked out. I said, nah. I said, come on, walk back in. So I walked back in the Star City Casino and there was a roulette wheel. I did this seven times in a row, right? Seven times every day, every time on my birthday. I put down a $5 note, got a $5 chip, and I said 32 red. I spun the wheel. It was like me standing there at the table. There's a guy spinning the wheel and the supervisor and me mate David S. And David just sat there. Unbelievable. I've never seen a bloke do such a thing. I did the same thing on my birthday. Now I'm going to pause this. It's saying reconnect. <laughs> so just said reconnect. Another time I went there with uh, Craig down at my friend's company office. This is the moment on holidays at a cower. <laughs> and um, a whole bunch of staff members. And we're sitting there on my birthday again. And I walked up and said, 32 red. Bing. Wang, 32 red. And there was four people witnessed that. <laughs> this went on for seven years. And on the last year, a friend of mine said to me, he said, I'll put the $5 on there for you. I said, well, give it to me and I'll put it on the table. But no, he put the $5 note down. So the casino sent it as his $5, put it down, and he said, got a $5 chip, and he put on 32 red. They spanned the wheel and it came up 32 red, and then he kept the money. Backstabber. So after that, I never played it ever again. But anyway, that's just another move. Anyway, let's get back onto it. Like a Mr. Hominoid. So you can have luck in the world. Right. Um, the point I was trying to get across was that unlike the city, the Byron Bay area and the Tweed Coast between Tweed Eds, Coolangatta, Mwollabar, Nimbin, Lismore, um, Casino, Casino is not that bad, but as I said, I was a cabbie, right, up there. Um, the drug scene is mainly, there's a lot of drugs in Lismore. There's a lot of drugs around Byron Bay, Nimbin, in Mwollomba because there's no police there. Now, this guy apparently two days ago was driving an unregistered car with no license, no number plates, around the back of Mwollomba down through Stoker siding and was going down the road and he said, I don't give a shit. They can find me all they like. He said, I'll be dead in six months. I'm dying of cancer. And his face was all chucked in, you know. He doesn't give a shit because there's no cops out there. Now, you're wondering why. Now, we started analysing. Um, I was talking to my friends up there, and I said, start to analyse, and they watched the YouTube I made, and then watched the 60 Minutes, and they watched the other one I made. And it, a lot of people are forgetting that the COVID-19 pandemic, we weren't allowed to leave home. And before that, we had the bushfires. And people weren't going anywhere. That whole area, I had videos of coming into, going to casino train station with my son driving and the bushfire smoke was so heavy, you know, in 2019, in the end of the year. Um, so, that's yes, Mr. Dog. Hello, Dog. Yeah. He's getting old now. Sorry about that. Um, I love my dog. Anyway, so... Why the Theo Hayes' wallet disappear from Bondi Beach? So Bondi, bloody Bondi in the brain. Uh, Byron Bay Beach, Cuddly Corner. How did it end up in a drug house at Nimbin for two years? 
Now, I rewatched the video, so I listened carefully. I made a mistake, and I'll be the first one to admit it. I said the lady was found June this year. She wasn't in June or July last year. So her body was only missing for six months. But her ID, now this is a very interesting point. I'm going to try and point out to you. See if you agree with it. If you've got an envelope, it's got your name on it, and it's unopened, and it's got a Bundaberg address, and it's found in a house at Nimbin. Did the drug dealer go to your house at Bundaberg? No. Did the person who took it there go to Bundaberg? No. What do you do? Ask yourself this. What do you do? You walk out the front, you've got your handbag or your carry, men's carry bag or whatever, and you say you got mail in your mailbox without a padlock on it. What do you do? You pick up your mail and you put it in your pocket and you wait till you get home or you put it in your briefcase or you put it in your shoulder bag, your handbag or men's shoulder bag or whatever. You take it with you because it's your mail and you know there's mail thieves around. Now, this letter was unopened, which means this woman had it on her when they found her body six months later in the location where she was found. Now, I'm still trying to find out where. I just recognise the trees and the bushes. Now, I'm going to put a little call out here. UK Ubla. Now, anybody heard of him? UK Ubla? U U U anyway, he does the um, abandoned houses. Now, I'm going to leave the camera again. Sorry. But I've got to get his spelling right. Hang on. I hadn't had a chance to clean up either. <laughs> I actually had the detectives here today. Is anybody watching my local area? Yes, it is. We're here. So, yesterday. <laughs> Not over Theo. It was over something else. It was just, as I said, there's a lot of shit goes on in this neighborhood, and I got attacked here. Hello, dog. You want to say Mr. Dog? Anybody, if you don't know Mr. Dog, hey, dog, you want to say hello? No, I'm walking away. Right. Okay, Ubla. Um, now, he's a YouTuber. He's up there around Lismore area. And he uh, does all the abandoned houses. Now, I'm quite sure he did. Um, the ones up there. Actually, I think I've actually got his number. Because we've actually uh, had conversations. But if you want to go look him up, so I'm not looking at you because I'm there. I'm sorry, I'm looking at you. Um, I'm going to have a look at him. Where's he going? He's disappeared. He's got a funny name. I know where he is. He's on Instagram. I'll we'll get him on Instagram. I'll we'll give him a ring. You can listen to the conversation. I don't care. I've got nothing to hide. Um, Frank Bay voice my message was not oh shit, 34 minutes ago. Oh, Frank, sorry, Frank. <laughs> oh, why they bought me, brother? My, oh, God, everybody's trying to ring me today. I don't know why. That's love me. Must want some money. <laughs> no, not really. Um, no, it's the other phone. Oh, two phones. Oh. Right, so let's see if we can get him. Now, this poor man is um, putting up with cancer. And he does his stories on these abandoned houses. And he gets out there and he travels around, all around um, um, Lismore Casino, Tenerfield, Guyra, Armadale, Sandy Flat, Bolivia, um, Ben Lohman. Um, he, he goes everywhere. Where is he? God. 
where you're going. Can't think of his proper first name. Doesn't come up, it comes up under his proper name. Um, oh, Chris, if you're watching this, can you give me a call? <laughs> um, I can't find it. God, can't find it. Get on, I've got to get on with him later. Right. Okay, Uber. EU something. I'll do it this way. I'll just go into YouTube. I'll see if I can find it that way. Just while I'm talking to you. Anyway, he went out there and he filmed um, these tents and squatters in the in the bush, exactly where this lady's tent was. Right, the same sort of big stick branches and. Um, Uh, put a U in there, see if that comes up. Let's see if it pops up. Um, no, that's not him. No, what all this other shit coming up? Oh, that's what I typed in wrong. Forgot to put the um. M, that's right. Right, now let's see if it comes up. Now there's me talking live there now. <laughs> I don't need that one, do we? No. Where is it? Oh, no, it's not there. Anyway, okay, so MK Ubler, he does all these disused houses throughout northern New South Wales, Brown Witch Edge, Byron Bay Hospital, uh, behind the Byron Bay Hospital, the big new one out there near the motorway. Uh, he goes in there, walks around, he's got his camera and he talks and he does everything. He's got cancer. And then he's doing up his little tiny caravan. You can see that. Um, um, Dorothy or whatever he calls it. And then he's the guy that goes around the beachfronts. He's the one that goes exploring through the bush. He finds these caravans out in the scrub. And, you know, he goes, oh, you know, drug addict's been here sort of thing. You know, he knows, right? This is the sort of person you want to get information of. So getting back to it, this other guy, this friend of mine in, the same Warmbar area, was talking to somebody just under two months ago. He was standing there, and this guy, this is what the the internet dropped out on, so it didn't really make sense, right? I'll say clearly now before it drops out. He was standing there loading his stuff up into his machine to go home. I'm not going to give away too much information, so if these drug addicts watch this video, they're not going to know who it is. Um. And this guy said to the girl at Mwollombar and the both ice addicts or heroin or whatever, do you want to hitchhike with me back down to the squat in Nimbin? Now, this is two months ago. Now, they found Theo's stuff there in June this year because of the COVID pandemic lockdown. People weren't travelling around New South Wales. People weren't allowed to drive their cars around. People weren't allowed to go more than five kilometres. Right? But the drug addicts didn't give a shit because they're drug addicts. They'd still get out in the high road and they hitchhike and they get a lift. Right? Or they catch a bus. And they put the face mask on and they go. Right? They're drug addicts. They don't care. They want to get their hit. They want to get their fix. Right? So this is one guy saying, you want to go from Wollombar to Nimbin. And then my friend was telling me that his friend that knows him real well also knows he goes to Byron Bay and hangs around the beaches. Interesting, isn't it? 
hangs around the beaches. And that's what they do. They go down through the bush in the beaches, as I said before. The tents, they do their drugs down in the beaches, in the bushes, so the cops don't see them. Because there's more police in Byron Bay, but there's none in Mwoolamba. Right? There's only patrol cars drop in there. They come, so like they might come up the Tweed Valley Way, drive in around Mwoolamba, just check a few number plates on the scanner, whatever, and piss off. Right? Unless they actually get a call, then they won't come out there. But Mwoolamba doesn't really have any crime. There's no breaking in, there's, there's no stealing. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows what goes on. If you rob somebody's house, mate, I'll tell you now, three hours later, the neighbor, they're going to come around bashing on your fucking door and get your shit back. Right? They, get, they ain't going to know. Right? Everybody knows everybody. It's a one horse town, if you know what that means. So they also walk out over the bridge where the drug deals are underneath the bridge and they walk out and they get on the Tweed Valley Way and they hitchhike down the coast, down Tweed Valley Way, down past the motorway, down past Brunswick Heads, down past that rest area, which is also where they sleep, what I said. You've got the fisherman's camping ground and you've got the tree line and then behind the tree line there's a power pole. That is the boundary. And then people drive in this side of the power pole, which is the Byron Bay City Council, this side of the power pole is, I said fisheries, it's not, it's uh, Australian Maritime Board, right? Maritime, which is federal. So you can park there and the council can't give you a ticket. And then there's the bushes at the back of the Caribbean Park in the Brunswick Heads for the fishermen. And the drug addicts go there. I park my bus there. I seen them come down there. And so then they walked up in the bushes on the other side of the council car park and going up there and done their drugs, right? And you see them all go, oh, <laughs> right? Well, that's stupid. I'd have a cab. I mean, we all know what a drug addict looks like when they're all off their face and when they're hanging out over here a bit, right? So my theory goes, and I'm still going to sort of stick with it, I reckon Theo has done what every other backpacker does. I sat there many a time at Belongeal Beach and they walk down, they put their clothes near the beach, right? Not right up the top. They don't put it down near the water. They put about five metres away, ten metres away from where the waves come in. If you think about it, isn't that what you do? Don't you put your towel down? Oh, about here, do, darling. We'll put our stuff here. And then you take your shirt off and you've got your shorts on and then you walk in and go for a swim, right? I mean, Theo might have went for a swim wearing his boxes. Nobody knows what clothes were recovered, right? All we got is a GPS tracker. That's all we got, a GPS tracker. Nobody said they found his pants. Nobody said they found his shoes. Nobody said they found his, his shirt or his boxes or his socks. They just said his wallet, his, sorry, his, his identification or stuff was found in Nimbin. Now, if I said to you stuff was found, how did you belong know it belonged to me? Well, if I pulled out that a driver's license, I won't show the front of it, there you go. That's my stuff, but it's got my name on it. It's a driver's license. That's still my stuff. That's how they knew it was Theo's. It had his name on it. Printed. Right, but if you find a bag with nothing in it, you don't know who it belongs to. So I'm going to presume it was his wallet with his ID in it. That's his stuff. Because if I say to people, I'm going out to the car. Oh shit! I forgot my stuff. It's on the bed. I go back and pick up my bag with my wallet, my key cards, my mask, me. You know, Opal car for catching a train and me concession cards and key cards and Medicare cards. That's just stuff, right? So that's what I'm detaining from what they said on 60 Minutes, his stuff. That must have been his wallet. And again, his phone was turned off at midnight and then it walked away at 12 noon. So if they couldn't open up the phone, now I said, right, okay, here you go, people. Um, there's my phone. 
crack the code. Come on, what is it? You can't crack it. So what are you going to do with it? You can throw it in the bin, aren't you? Because the phone went flat. You're just going to get rid of it. But my staff, he said, I'll keep that. Put it in his pocket. And remember the story, the news story. I really, really listened to it. I've done my homework. They said four days later, the mother rang up and reported her son missing. Four days later, he's missing. They went out to the hostel and they went through all the hostels. They said, yes, he was here. He hasn't been back for four days. And I said, I've had backpackers travel around with me for two days, even though they paid for seven days in a hostel. And they don't tell the hostel where they're going because they're not their parents. They want their, they're over 20. They're legally allowed to go wherever they want. They're halfway around the world. They're adults. And they go where they want. So he goes, going down there. Now, there's no wiggly lines in the track in the GPS. There's no skirmish marks as if it shows him fighting with somebody or running around trying to get away. It just shows him walking down the beach, walking up to a dead end, walking up the embankment. Google sent him up the wrong track. He's had a sticky boot. Probably looked at the view and said, oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, look, I can see out over the ocean a bit. Walk back down again where it says, you know, dangerous rock slides. Walk back down again. And as I said, before he went up there, he watched part of his famous uh, Belgium story. And then I know from personal experience, and I don't know how many people out there watching this video, this video's YouTube's already had plenty of hits so far, the other two. It's going up every day by about 20, 20 a day. This is only heading Byron Bay, Theo. Um, it's, I reckon people are going to say they can relate to that. You would walk down, where we walk down, put his phone down on his shirt, might have even had his pants on, and ducked in there for a dip. And let's show the current come round, grabbed him. Now, you all know if you're wearing a long pair of pants, Water's going to grab that like a sail on a sailboat. You're gone. It's going to walk into those pants and it's going to drag you, right? Who's been swimming wearing a long pair of pants in the ocean? You don't do it, do you? But if he did do that, there's another theory. Theory, not fact. But it's a fact that if you wear long pants in the ocean with the pants that I've seen him wearing on the YouTube, they've got pockets. Pockets contain water. Containing water means pull, which means that water can get a grip on you, same as a drag. That's why the Americans at one stage during the Olympic Games got upset when the Australian swimmers showed up there wearing Speedos way back in the 1970s instead of wearing long board shorts. The old-fashioned swimmers, they used to wear the big long swimmers. Remember the ones you see the comedy movies with the black and white stripes on them? And then all of a sudden the Australians showed up there wearing Speedos. Speedos were made by Speedo Swimwear at Windsor in Milam Street way back in the 70s. And they gave them to the Olympic swimmers. Then later on they put the green and the gold with the kangaroo and the stars on them. Right? Now what do you see all around the world? People wearing Speedos. Those little tiny briefs. Right? Speedos for men. That's what they wear. Then they went over to like a lycra sort of tight swimsuit. So that's another thing. That's what I mean. Dynamics of swimming in water. So if he's wearing baggy clothes, that could possibly pull him away, right? Then along comes of somebody walking along the beach who was a local. And the point I said was, and the, and the internet cracked up, was a local person would walk around that rock face because they know the tides, they know the waves, and they're prepared to take the chance and walk around and go where the backpackers don't walk. Because if you're a backpacker from a foreign country, you break your leg and you're tied up there for six weeks. And I've had a Danish guy stay with me who had a broken leg. And he said he had to wait two months to get money from his parents to get him home back in 1993. So I know what I'm talking about. The hassle, some of these backpackers come out here, 
something goes wrong, they don't have the Australian medical Medicare card, and they cash, and it takes all their money for their holiday. What now? Not 1993. Now 2021. You have medical insurance, right, for travellers. That's the difference, right? But let's say even if they break their leg, they're still going to be put up somewhere. You're not going to sit on a bus with a broken leg and go from Sydney to Melbourne to Brisbane or whatever in Cairns and try to enjoy your holiday. You're just going to go park yourself somewhere for six weeks until that plaster cast comes off and you heal and then you start walking. So to me, for that reason alone, Bit of common sense. If I was a backpacker, there's no way in this world. If I travelled over to England I w- or America, there's no way in the world I'd walk around the base of the Statue of Liberty. I'd walk around the front of the edge of, of the ocean anywhere in England or Ireland or Scotland or any other place because I'm unfamiliar with the terrain. It's like when they send the troops overseas. They get them a briefing before a troop goes into battle in a foreign country. And they do all that satellite tracking now, you know, when they did Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran and all the rest of the shit. But, and they zoom in, they say, oh, look, you know, and they have people on the ground and do all the research. Hello, dog. Mr. Dog's here. I say, hello, Mr. Dog. Look, there he is. Put his head up. Oh. Yeah, there's my dog. I say, hello, Mr. Dog. I say, hello. There he is. Look, isn't he lovely? Hey, aren't you lovely? Yeah. You tell everybody you're handsome. Yeah. Anyway, it's going to love you, dog. So I reckon it's a local family's wallet. How else we get it in the Nimbin? A backpacker's not going to find his phone and his ID and take it to the Nimbin or his ID to Nimbin. It'd be a local and it'd be a drug addict because it went to a drug house. And the drug addicts go by and by to Bangalore, to Lismore, drug area, to Nimbin, drug area, Moolamba, drug area, down the highway to an inland to Mullumbimby, drug area, or out to the beaches around Brunswick Heads that go all the way down the coast, that dirty, rusty water I showed in the previous video. That's what I'm talking about. They squat down there in their tents 20 years ago. Not recently, but 20 years ago when I was up there, they used to go out there in their tents and then the rangers would come along and pick up all their tents. You see what I'm trying to say? Someone's walked past, found his phone, found his wallet, dumped his clothes, didn't bother with them. They're not going to pick them up and carry them all around the headland. Uh, no, I wouldn't pick them up. I mean, would you come in here and pick up my old my old singlet, uh, this and you found that on the beach? Would you pick it up and take it home? No, you just say, oh, I don't want that. I don't know what I belong to. You see a wallet, you see a phone. Oh, yeah. You know? right. I just got a bloke here from my place. He just went to jail. Right? I'll show you. I'll show you what he got a thumb for. Mobile phones, Apple iPhones. That's that's what he got done for. That's what I said. The detectives were here yesterday. They're building a bigger case up against him. See all the circuitry shit. Right? I had no idea he was doing it. How would I know? I'm an old man. I'm sitting here. I'm on my own business. I sat in my room. I watch TV. I've got two bad legs. I've got to get two knee replacements. And his condition of being here was he meant to mow the lawns and clean up the backyard and do all the rest. And next thing I know, he's got this computer. Now, get in a look at my internet. I have not done a live chat for eight months because he took my computer and he was using this very computer and he was using it to hack in and I found his paperwork he was doing an Apple iPhone course to break into mobile phones. Right? And he, apparently he got charged years ago for it. And he now and then they picked him up on that computer accessing Apple iPhone. Apple iPhone then contacted the police and they're going, what? What's his army? What's the internet address here? They know me. 
from past experiences of idiots, burnout, hit running in the cars, and they know I'm a cab driver. My name comes up. Straight away, my name comes up. They would have sat across the road, scanned my number, played as I drove in. I oh, know he's 60, he's 61 years of age. It wouldn't be him. Then they see Dickhead walking out down the driveway, going down the street, take a discreet photo of him, run it through photo recognition. Oh, there's this guy. Got him, right? So I'm saying, this is why this guy, whoever took his phone, would have ditched it. Right? They would have ditched it. And the cops said, we don't even want that. They don't need it. They've already got all that. They've already got all the serial numbers, everything that he's trying to put through. It's all on the computer. They've already downloaded everything. See? And then they come in and they said, right, get your computer, wipe it. They took a copy of the whole computer. And the only thing on there was my name, email address, not Mr. Homidoy, just my name, email address, and that was it for Windows 10. And then the rest of it, they said, that's all right. Had me on the head sort of thing. So, no, that's all right, good boy. We're doing this. Copied all that. Where they went. So I said, don't, don't stop with Mr. Homidoy, right? Let that phone hacker try to get on, right? So that's what I'm saying here. That drug addict, when he took that phone, he would have just thrown it in the bin. Right? Now you're starting to get what I'm trying to say. I don't just sit there. I dealt with thieves and con artists and ice addicts and drug addicts. I drove a cab. <laughs> right. So he picked the phone up, thrown it in the rubbish bin, kept his wallet. His mother's reported him to the police four days later. And I'll tell you now, he come out of the news here. It was on the news. Belgium backpacker disappears in Byron Bay. Go and look it on YouTube. Big headlines. I reckon that guy would have been sitting over there in the Nimbin pub and seen it and gone, oh, shit. Looked at the story, seen the name Theo, and if he was in the pub or his mates told him about it, oh, you know that wallet you got with the name Theo on it, and he's opened it up and then gone back in and looked at the news story himself. It was broadcasted every 30 minutes up that way. It was, oh, shit, that's his wallet. We'll dump it in the old drug house at Nimbin. And then COVID-19's come along. Borders are shut. Towns are shut. You can't go more than five k's for nine months. You can't leave your area. I can't go to see my son for the last two years. And it's been two years since he disappeared till they found his wallet. A different time slot of two years. But still, her stuff was in the same house six months after he disappeared. Oh, sorry, she disappeared six months after he disappeared. And then six months after that, the following June, one year later after Theo disappeared. Now, let's be very clear on this. One year later, virtually to the day, her body was found after Theo disappeared. And then they found his stuff June this year. So 12 months on with the COVID-19 epidemic. Everybody's forgetting about the epidemic. I said, is it a male murderer, male and female murderer? I'm going to take that back. I think it's just a very simple case. Boy's gone for a swim. He's drowned. He's got washed out to sea and he's been eaten by a shark. That would be the most easiest, simplest thing to let it go. And the majority of the locals I spoke to at Byron Bay said he got eaten by a shark. Now, if you don't believe me, go down and look at YouTube on the news stories and there's the old shipwreck at Belongel Beach behind the fish market. And there are several stories of girls and boys went swimming at Belongel Beach right out front of the Byron Hotel there near the Byron Bay Fish and Chips and to the left there's a set of rocks and then there's a shipwreck and there's a big set of rocks out there in the ocean. And they've had to climb up onto the rocks and wait for the uh, surf life-saving rescue 
to get a boat out took them over an hour because nobody ever really ever drowns up there because everybody knows where not to swim. And if they swim on the north side of Byron Bay headland, right, there's lifeguards and that up there. But on that cosy corner, there's no lifeguards because there's no tourist parks, there's no tourism, and people don't go there to swim. Only the surfers go out there and they catch the waves. And that's where the computer broke down in the conversation. And I was said about, and then it come back, and the computer cut back in, or then I was talking about Suffolk Park. It jumped from me saying, people don't swim around Cuddly Corner because the ocean comes around the headland, and it's a strong current. And then as it goes down the coast, the current pulls away from the beach, and all the caravan parks are down there, and people can go in there with their kids, reasonably safe, and have a swim. So go and look at it yourself. Now, we'll try it again. The computer seems to be behaving itself. So this is a remake. Here's Suffolk Park. Here's Byron Bay. And then, again, you can see the big swirling current north of the Byron Bay Lighthouse. That's what I'm trying to say. He's gone in right here. See what I'm saying? Now, you come down here to Suffolk Park. See, you got all the caravan parks and all the houses are down there. But when you look up the other part, just trying to get this right on this phone. Go and look for it at it yourself. Right. So you see Woolworths. This camera here to. See, there's no houses up the top. But down there at Suffolk Park, see? See what I'm trying Down here, here's all the caravan parks, and that's bush. Right? That's what I'm trying to say. And then when you go up this side, The other side of Byron Bay, there's the wreck. Now you notice something different. Can you see the floor of the ocean? See the difference in depth? And that is that side of Byron Bay. See, you can see the bottom of the sand in the water. And that's called Main Beach. Let the camera adjust in case you haven't got a computer. Some people only get to watch this stuff on a TV set. Not everybody's got a computer, right? See, you can see the sandbar protects the beach from the main current. See the sandbar out there in the ocean? That's what I'm trying to get at. He's going around the other side where the current comes sweeping past. He's got taken away. Somebody's grabbed the phone, gone around, thrown it in the bin, kept his wallet, went to Nimbin four days later and turned around and said, oh, shit, he's on the news. He's up there, right? Uh, we better ditch the wallet. We'll throw it in, that, in the drugos house. And um, and that's what they've done. Now, I'm going to type in here. I'm going to say um, Byron, <laughs> Mr. B. Right. I'm going to do this while I'm talking to you. 
Byron Bay missing backpack, right? There we go. Now, the first one we got uh, one year on, then we've got six months on, then we got me one day ago. Theo is missing uh, 2.1 thousand views. Human bones found. Um, that's down the south price. Why do people go missing? Now, that's another one we haven't seen. That's got Theo in it. Now, that's this one here. A lot of people hear prescription retinoid. Bloody stupid, eh? That's what I said last on. night. Drinks. And he wasn't aggressive or causing any issues. It is assumed that Theo walked back to the backpacker's hostel and that something happened to him on his way back. Byron is a very small place and the hostel was an easy walk from town. But after obtaining Theo's Google records, who is this guy? It's determined that Theo didn't go back to the hostel that night. He's a pommy guy. And he didn't even attempt to. CCTV footage shows him walking off into the night at 11 p.m. And we know that he messaged some friends and sent a WhatsApp message to his stepsister at around 1 a.m. We also know that he used Google Maps to get back to the backpacker hostel. But despite using this app, he walked in the opposite direction from the hostel. And as you can see from the map on the screen, the route that Theo took makes absolutely no sense. The hostel is at the top left corner of the map and would take approximately 20 minutes to get there. Byron Bay Lighthouse now, the top right hand side corner. Who's this guy? Um, and that journey would take well over an hour. Shut up. Now, I, I love these guys. Disturbing. True crime. He's never been, he's never been to Byron Bay. He wouldn't know the first thing about it. He's feeding off the information he's got from the media. And that was, um, how long ago was that? That was, God knows how long ago. Right? The phone data had then come available. Right? And then, you know, <laughs> they're just unreal. They come out here and they, they try to, they want to do a YouTube story in something in another country that they know nothing about. <laughs> I'm here. I'm going there. Yeah. So let's go walk. I made arrangements today. We're going to go retrace Theo's steps. Of course, I'm a cripple. I'm going to use my car. But we're going to park out front of the cheeky monkey and hopefully within the 34-minute time limit of on one, one camera, we're going to film exactly where he walked. And then we're going to go across the park, and I'll drive next to the park. Well, I won't be able to drive the car through the park, will I? I mean, come on, common sense. I'll drive around the park, and then we'll make go the way he went. We'll find the trail. I'll pause the video, and I'll do little bits walking down the trail, and then I'll get down the beach. And appreciate it. I've got no knee joints in my kneecaps. Right? I've got bone on bone. And we're going to walk up to exactly where Theo last stood. And I made that phone call an hour ago. And they said, by all means, this old mate of mine, he also, 76 years of age, he also wants, he's sick and tired of hearing about it. And these drug addicts and what goes on. And he's been on my YouTube channel before on previously deleted videos. But I've got to do rail trail. I've got to do the railway line bridges up there as well. So there's going to be a whole heap of shit, stuff, shit, crap, whatever you want to call it, uploaded when I get up there. Now, what people don't know is I take my own mobile internet. No, I don't use data on a phone to upload YouTube, right? I have a device that goes in my car, gives me 240 to volt. I'll take this computer with this monitor 
with this camera and we'll plug it into my mobile modem, it runs on 240 volt, goes to a Telstra tower at Byron Bay and we'll do a live stream from Byron Bay somewhere. I don't know exactly where. I'm not going to do it out in the wind. It might be raining. It might be, I don't know yet. I'm not there. <laughs> so to get this, help get this case solved, and then we'll see if we can find somebody, because of my crippled legs, who might demonstrate how hard or easy it is to walk around where his phone went after 12 noon. And then I'll go over and I'll see my cousin I haven't seen for 50 years. And I'm quite sure he'd know where the house is. And let's go find that abandoned drug addict's house. Now let's go have our own look at it. And then we'll start put these bits and pieces together. So I'm leaving Sydney. I'm 61 years of age with no knee joints. And we're going to go to Byron Bay and we're going to go check it out. And I really would like to see a comment. Would you like me to do this? Will you think it'd be interesting? This is coming out of my pockets, my own pocket. I don't sell T-shirts. I don't sell hats. I don't get sponsored by kitty games. This comes out of my pocket because I'm interested in helping solve missing PO. And then we're going to take along a few things. Let's take along an empty milk bottle and we'll put a weight on it in a string and we'll throw it out in the ocean and see if that goes somewhere. We'll see if I, if I still remember to do it. I'm getting old. I might forget to do it. So leave me a comment. Don't forget the milk bottle, right? You know those bottles they throw in the ocean and they mark the currents? Let's see where that goes. Right at the spot where Theo went in. Let's see if it goes disappearing out and we might even take a, a fishing rod and then I'll reel it back in. So I say, oh, look at that. Look how quick that went out as an experiment. Let's go examine. Let's go see and start putting some of this mystical, as I called it last night. You really didn't come up on the camera. I call it the Theo sandwich of mysteries, right? So you've got your bread. That's what all that was about, right? And then you've got your salami. Then, then you've got your Devon. Look, I've even got a compass in case we get lost. Right, and then you've got your recipe, and then you make up your sandwich, right? So that's the Theo sandwich of mystery, right? Let's debunk the theories. Let's debunk everything else. Let's try and go on some facts. If he has gone out into the ocean, we're not going to find him because of 750,000 years, it took the sandstone to go from Sydney to Fraser Island. It took several years for the boy from France to wash up 100 k's north up on the beach, wherever, somewhere there. Go down and look at the channel. Missing Prince backpack, Backpacker, Body Found, Bones Up on the Beach, on two different beaches. Got two different beaches. He went in the Shelley Beach, north of Newcastle, and his bone remains were found over a period of time north of Shelley Beach. Right? So there you go. We don't know. We all don't know. Well, at least I'm making an attempt to find out what happened and to see if I can do use my um, personality, my rough exterior look, uh, unshaven, look like a hippie, or let me hair grow and sort of go undercover a little bit and see, and I know the locals up there know me, it's a good old bloke the ones that do remember me from 20 years ago. And you want to know how good the Byron Bay people's memories are? Try this one on for size. This is a true story. I pulled up in front of the old movie theatre, which is now the new Woolworths at Byron Bay in 1997. 1997. This is how good people's memories are. And I pulled up there and this family walked from the old Woolworths, come over, 
and they had the car in front of my bus and they're loading the stuff in the boot and the, and the kid walked around to me and said, I love your bus, mate. Can I come and have a look? I said, as long as you get mum and dad. Right? Don't be a kid. Right? And then I walked down the stairs onto the footpath and I said, your son has just asked me with his brother at the time, can we look at your bus? And I said, only if mum and dad come in with him. And they said, yes, by all means. I'd love to have a look, says the father. He said, I've always wanted to do a big bus at, as, as a house. This is how good people's memories are in Byron Bay, right? They walked in. The door stayed open. I opened up the curtains. They walked in. They seen the whole double bed, the shower, the microwave, the box still, how it was hanging up on the ceiling, everything. And the father said, oh, yeah. I said perspex yesterday. I meant to say conduit. And the conduit with the plastic saddles and my taxi photo was stuck up in the conduit. So there's another correction. Father says, oh, you're a cab driver. Immediately, psh, stress goes away. Talked about the water tanks, the 12 volt pumps, the solar panels, generators, whatever else, uh, what they call single sign, S-I-N-E, single sign electric converter. There you go. Go look that one up. See if I'm bullshitting you. Right, that's how you can run a computer and internet. That's actually what's going with me. A $3,000 single sign generator inverter. It's about this big and weighs about 30 kilos, 40 kilos. It's got a seven hour, seven hour fuel tank in it. I still got it, right? Just pull, Yamaha, single sign in fuel inverter. Um, single sign electricity converter, right? You've got two 10 amp plugs, battery charger, and gauges and it tells you everything, right? Fuel tank, uh, electric start, key, the lot, right? Look them up. Yamaha 3000, I think it's called. Gonna look at them, they're worth about 3000 bucks. Anyway, that's going up there with me. So I don't stuff around. If I'm going to do something up there properly, I'm going to do it properly. I'm not going to drive all the way to Byron Bay and hope to find a PowerPoint. I'm going to take my own electricity, which cost me 3000 bucks, right? Which used to be in my bus. Still got it. It's only ever run 40 hours, right? So I said the worst thing I could do was sell the bus. So we're going to go around, and then I can come back. Stage by stage, it's going to be out of order. The first one's going to be last, and the last one's going to be first. So then you're going to have to go back down through YouTube, because remember, when you upload a YouTube, it builds it on top. So the first one you do is going to be down the bottom. So it's going to be part 10 and then go down to part 1. And if you play part 1, it's going to go down the one before that. So then you have to re-go back to part 2, part 3. I can't sit there and save it, right, on the phone. I'll run out of memory. I've got to upload it, clear the memory on the phone, because I use two Samsung phones. That's what I use. The one with the thing to scan your airline tickets and everything else. And this previous one only has a standard camera on it. This is the one that's done a lot of videos. This is the one I did Tenerfield video and done everything else. Right? I got a thousand dollars worth of camera system sitting over there. I tried that. And it comes up all the different pictures, but it won't let me edit it. It won't let me do anything I want to do. It just sits there. I've got eight cameras, and they film, I can zoom in, I can change the contrast, but I can't edit it. And it's got no voice recording, and I didn't know. I said to the guy, has it got voice recording? He said, yes, you plug the microphone in here. Then I took it back to another bloke. He said, no, that's not where the microphone goes. That's a camera slot. You've got to put it in over here. So then I paid for a, a microphone through Amazon. And it comes out and it says, oh, yeah, it's a recording. You see me voice going like this. And then when I play it back on the TV set, that one over there before it blew up, there's no volume. It's a $1,000 worth of cameras. What I said? Oh, yeah.
and the units in there somewhere. I don't use it. You know the old Aussie expression, I'm over the bullshit? <laughs> I am, I'm over the bullshit. So that's how we're going to do it. Two cameras. And he said, oh, why don't you go and get a camera on a stick and do like all the other people doing the walk down the road and you see the camera down it? Done that. I took it back. I bought the camera on the stick with the screw it on the bottom, clip it all on. Got it home here, filmed it right there on that chair. And then I took it back to the bloke. I won't say the name of the company because they gave me back all my money. And then the next thing I you know, my hero comes along, Crouton Bear in America says, do they give you a so-and-so card to go along with the memory card? And I said, no. So I went back over to him. I said, what's this about a so-and-so card? Oh, yeah, you've got to have one of them. I said, well, you didn't sell me one. I said, that's why I returned the camera. So was it my fault? No. It's a stupid electronics shop. They couldn't even sell me. They could not even sell me. $800 worth of walk around camera with microphone and pause and that so I don't have to worry about pausing this and then hoping it doesn't switch off or bump a button and then it, then it comes to an end of it, right? They couldn't even sell me a camera on a stick, a toggle switch, like Bald and Bankrupt or Mr. Bald or like um, that guy who never talks and gets on trains and goes around lifting up dunny seats over there in Wales. <laughs> right? I mean, I I messaged him. I said, why don't you ever talk? He said, I don't want to talk. And then one day he did talk on a video. And then as soon as I heard his voice, because I asked him for his ticket, and he said, oh, yes, here's my ticket, I picked up exactly why he never talked because he had a mental impairment. Because, you know, when somebody's got like a Down syndrome or, or some other sort of mental issue, you can pick it up. I was a cab driver. I dealt with wheelchairs and Down syndromes and cripples and quadriplegics and paraplegics. And I've had to change people's pants when they put themselves in the back of a cab and I've had to change them, men and women shit themselves in a cab and they're going to sit in the cab for another hour to get home. I said, do you think I'm going to sit with somebody pooping their pants in the back of my cab? Oh, no thanks. 30 years ago? No. And of course, we did it properly. Put a towel over them and we parked up a side street and they got the clothes out and put them in a place. I used to give a roll of plastic bags in the boot. A spare clothes in the boot. I come prepared. I did my homework. Anyway, that's getting off the story. So we're going to do my homework before I leave here and go up there to Byron Bay. My mind is completely open to the world. You might be inhibited. You might be embarrassed. I had a housemate. He was absolutely embarrassed. A male man, 35 years of age. Absolutely horrified if you've seen him without wearing a shirt. God's on the street. I went to school with a guy. Right? He's now 60. And he's still the same. Oh, no, can't see me without a shirt on. He's still the same. There's people like that in the world, right? People are scared of spiders and snakes. And they go, <laughs> I know a bloke called Billy. You show him a little tiny grass spider this big, he will scream and run. Mate, doesn't worry me. I've got that sort of um, Asperger's. I have no fear. I have no emotion in the sense of, oh, that's scary. Oh, that's a crocodile. I'll look at a crocodile and say, yeah, okay, it's a crocodile. But I won't, I'll be waiting for it to jump at me, but I won't be scared of it. I'll just sit and look at it and say, yeah, right. I don't get adrenaline rushes. I don't get all worked up. I get my voice gets worked up. Yeah, I, I can do that. So that's all an act. That's all for the camera. But anyway, let's go to Byron Bay. Let's check out. Let's go do the Theo story. Let's go. And now you're learning something more about me. Right? I drive the camp. I've seen everything in the world to see there is to see. I've been through the hell. I've been a paraplegic. Want to look? Where is it? Here. Save your legs. Want to see the surgery? 
sua salida. It says big sky on the front of me lake. Look. Where's it? See? Sky's on that leg too. Look. Look, it is right there. Look. That's a paraplegic. They told me I'd never ever walk again. Hey, where you going? Come back here with me, camera. <laughs> See? You're going to learn to live life. You can learn to live life and love it and enjoy it. See a big scar there? Look. There's the other one. Where is it? Do you see it? The big thing. See the big black thing there? Look. See the big scar? That's where they cut cut my arms open. They pulled my elbow joints apart and cleaned all the shit out of it. All the all the or the bone matter, right? There you go, got another Facebook message. <laughs> right, I've had both arms pulled apart. I had to be hand fed for three months. And a guy who's now just come back to Sydney from Queensland after the border opened, hand fed me every day, morning, noon and night, ham and pickle sandwiches, because he's schizophrenic. That's all he made me. Ham and pickle sandwiches for three months. If you don't believe me, I've got the photos. And when I find this bloody sticky one day, and I'll do a story on what I used to look like, 163 kilos, big and fat, and a big fat ass. And they used to put the coffee cup on the back of my bum cheek. My bum cheek was that big. I was like that. That's how big my bum cheek. Can't even do it that way. There's my bum cheek. You'd stick a coffee cup on it. And that's how big my bum was, right? I've had three coffee cups sitting across my backside, four actually, two on, two on either buttock with coffee in them, not empty. Anyway, this get back on my elbows. I had my arms only used to go like this. My son Chris will leave a comment. My arms only used to do that. And they go like this. Look. And the one that fed me the ham and pickles said to me, he said, I don't know how you used to drive the car from Byron Bay back to Sydney before I had the surgery. And then there's a photo of So I still got the photos of big black arms. All this is black for three months. It took me three months to lift my arm up from the bed and pick up an empty coffee cup. And my doctor told me I'm a survivor. I'm a fighter. I keep going and I keep going and I keep going. And we will try and solve this, Theo. All right. Anyway, nothing me raving and ranting. Got off, Theo. But it's better that you understand me to understand where I'm coming from when I take the stuff up there and don't sit in your mind and say, why don't you use this sort of camera? Why do you just use a phone camera? I've already had that sound of cameras. I've already bought a camera on stick and the phone shop stuffed up up. And then they turned around and said, oh, you've got to get this little tiny memory card out. Then you've got to stick it in this and you've got to stick it in that. And I went, that's just too bloody hard. I'm an old man. But I'm an old man. Oh, a minute. I'd rather just go zip on the phone, put in my password, hit YouTube, upload it, and then come back onto this later on and re-edit the heading. Very simple. Why complicate life when life is complicated enough already? <laughs> see you later from Mr. Hominoid. Let's go find Theo stuff. Let's try and find something on Theo. Let's see if I can run into a couple of druggies in Nimbin. Let's see if I can find a couple of druggies around Byron Bay who might know something about the missing wallet. Let's see if we can find somebody who might know something about Bertie's phone. Let's see if we can find out whatever we can find out. And I really want to really see a bloody comment, right? Not me say, leave me a comment, and there's no comments coming up. I get phone calls. I want to see comments below this. Do you want me to go to Byron Bay and get up there and take a $3,000 generator camera gear and power leads and all the other crap and pay the fuel 
and stay up there and travel all around Byron Bay. Mind you, I'm traveling 900 kilometers up. Then when I get up there where I'm staying, I've got to travel 80 kilometers back to Byron Bay and then another 80, 70 kilometers out to Nimbin and then another 40, 50 kilometers back up to Moolumbar or back around to Brunswick or back around over to somewhere else and see where we go. It's all cost me money. I don't sell T-shirts. I don't sell coffee cups. I don't sell anything. I do it all out of my own pocket. And I do have a thing called Mr. Hominoid at Patreon. And I've never received one cent yet. Because no one ever bothers. Right? Because people would rather just sit there, turn there, watch this and say, well, that stupid old Australian bloke, he's on there again, he's raving around. Right? But it costs you money. That's why I deleted 400 videos before because they only had 10 to 15 views on them. And beautiful crew on Bear over in Houston, Texas, said, why did you delete them? We love watching them because you're so original. And crew on Bear left YouTube, and she's now on Rumble, where she gets paid. Every time her video gets watched, she gets $5 or something. Rumble, right? It's in Canada. Anyway. Get off. See you later. So we'll be back. Hopefully, if I don't do another video before I go, uh, I'm not going to tell you this address, obviously. Um, I'm not saying exactly when I'm leaving. I'm not saying exactly when I get back. You're just going to see the Byron Bay story. Right? I shouldn't have even said I'm going to go to Byron Bay. But if you are somewhere around the world, yes. And yes, and I'm going to tell this is the truth, Detectives are going to have the keys to this house while I'm going away when I do go away. Right? And my neighbours also watch. So there you go. So don't think if you're a local and you think you're going to come around and have some fun when I'm going out, don't be warned that these have got the keys to the house because I gave them to them yesterday. Because I've got nothing to hide, mate. I'm an old man. If I get murdered in this house here by myself with the dog, who's going to find me? Well, not stupid. I cover my own ass, don't you? Isn't that what buddies do in the military? Everybody comes home. We watch our buddies back. Just drugos. Look at this drugo. It's that Emmy. He's in jail. He's doing 12 months. Tell ya. Hi, on. Mr. Dog says hello. He's out there slopping away in his water bucket. <laughs> See you. Love you. God bless. Keep a smile on your face. Leave me a comment. You want me to go to Byron Bay? Yes or no? Leave me a comment. At least want to say over 10 yeses. Right? If not more, 10 yeses, 10 whys on comment. Just give me a why. What do you reckon, dog? You want to go to Byron? Want to go surfing? 